and change course, change direction, and go in a better direction for America's future. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Just the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Mr. President? Senator from Utah. I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be suspended. Without objection. Mr. President, everyone knows that the vote we're about to take, cloture on the House passed continuing resolution, is essentially a vote to allow the Democrats to gut the House bill. That's why the Senate Majority Leader the senator from Nevada, Senator Reid, and every other Senate Democrat are supporting it. 21 House members know that this is a vote to gut the bill that they passed, that they worked so hard to pass out of the House of Representatives. That's why they signed a letter yesterday asking the Senate Republicans stand united and vote against cloture on this bill. You see, what happened was the House of Representatives, acting boldly and nobly, and in response to a growing cry from the American people, a cry for help, acted to keep the government funded, to fund government while defunding Obamacare, protecting the American people from a law that they're becoming increasingly aware of. A law that was passed three and a half years ago without members of Congress having read it, in all of its 2,700 pages. A law that has since led to the promulgation of 20,000 pages of implementing regulatory text. A law that has since been rewritten not just once but twice by the Supreme Court of the United States, which, having concluded that the law as written was constitutionally deficient in two respects, 
became convinced that it was its duty, its prerogative, and within its power to rewrite the law in order to shoehorn it within the provisions of the U.S. Constitution. A law that has since then been rewritten three or four times by the President of the United States without any statutory or constitutional authorization to do so. A President who has acknowledged that the legislation, this law, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, is not ready to be implemented. If the President of the United States is convinced that this law is not ready to be implemented, if the President of the United States who pushed this law through Congress three and a half years ago and counts this as his signature legislative accomplishment. If this same president is unwilling to follow the law and is convinced that it's not ready to implement, Congress should not fund it. And Congress should keep government funded while protecting the people from Obamacare. Millions of Americans are concerned about what this law will do for them. We've seen millions of Americans worried about keeping their jobs, noticing that jobs are becoming harder and harder to find. Many are losing their jobs. Others are seeing their wages cut. Others still are seeing their hours cut. Many, including those 20,000 Americans who work for Home Depot, who were informed last week that, like many other Americans, they'll be losing their health coverage. This is why the House of Representatives acted. This is why what the House of Representatives did by passing this continuing resolution is such a good thing. It keeps government funded, and it protects the American people from the harmful effects of Obamacare. Now we get over to the Senate, and when we came to the Senate, we saw that the Senate really had a, a couple of options, a couple of very legitimate options upon receiving this legislation from the House. The Senate could take up this legislation and subject the legislation to an open amendment process, allowing Democrats and Republicans to submit amendments as they deemed fit, to debate those amendments, discuss their relative merits, their pros and their cons, and ultimately vote on them, making compromises and adjustments along the way in the forum that has long been honored and revered in this institution, which heralds itself as the world's greatest deliberative body. Another option, of course, could be to bring it up for a vote as is, an up or down vote based on what the House passed. You can vote on it as it was passed by the House, or you can subject it to an open amendment process. Either one of those things would be fine. If that's what we were looking at, I would be voting yes on this cloture vote on this bill. That, however, is not the option that the Majority Leader, Harry Reid, selected. Instead, what he chose was a different procedure whereby he would select a single amendment, one that guts the House passed bill of its most important provisions without allowing anyone else the opportunity even to present an amendment and have that considered for a vote. Well, the American people are tired of the games that hide the true meaning of this kind of tactic, of this kind of vote. And so it's incumbent upon us to try to explain them as best we can the people who elect us do expect us to do what we say we're going to do. Not sometimes, not just when it's convenient. In fact, they ex expect us to do what we say we're going to do, especially when it's inconvenient. And that's really what this first vote is about. Cloture on this bill is about showing the American people that we'll do what we say we're going to do, even when, especially when, it's inconvenient. We have the ability to prevent the majority leader, Senator Harry Reid, from unfairly gutting the House continuing resolution. If we all vote no, that is what we will achieve. It's what many of us have told, have promised the American people that we will do. I, along with several of my colleagues, including Senators Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, Rand Paul, and several others, have promised to do everything in our power to bring the message that we've received, received overwhelmingly and repeatedly from the American people, to bring that message inside this chamber, inside these halls. That's what this effort has been all about. We promise to do everything we can to improve the procedure and improve the outcome for the American people. 
taking their message to Washington, incorporating their message into our legislative strategy. Across this great country, Americans stayed up with us this week. They stayed up with us even overnight, choosing to forego sleep just to show that they were supportive in this effort. And we greatly appreciate that. And I, I, I want you all uh, who have participated in this effort in one way or another to reflect on how you feel at this very moment. It's been said that opportunity looks a lot like hard work. Our change is really hard work, especially here in Washington. This is what it feels like to take on Washington. This is what it feels like to take on the immense and intimidating inertia of big government. This is what it feels like to do what the American people ask and expect and demand. Those of you who have been involved in this effort should be proud, should feel energized and motivated to take on the next big challenge. The American people, of course, expect more and deserve better than what they frequently get from Washington. I wish I could say that the fight that has ensued over the last few days were just about Obamacare and, and nothing more. Sadly, Obamacare is just one symptom of a much larger problem. It all stems from the syndrome of self-importance that the political ruling class in Washington tends to feel. The bigger problem in Washington is that the bigger the problem the American people face, the more people in Washington tend to think Washington has all the answers. Obamacare, like the fiscal cliff, like our $17 trillion debt, like our almost $1 trillion annual deficit, like our $2 trillion annual regulatory compliance cost in this country, are all the natural, inevitable result of a federal government that is simply too big and too expensive, that delves far too deeply into the lives of the American people, delves far too deeply into everything from our communications to our health care decisions, into everything from what kind of light bulbs we use to how much water our toilets flush. These are deep and personal decisions that are getting deeper and more personal every single day. The American people understand that they are the sovereigns in this country. They are not subjects. We, the people, are citizens. The government works for us, even though it sometimes has started to feel like it's the other way around. All these things show what happens when the political elite, not we, the people, pretend to be in control. This is not about any one person or even any one policy or any one political party. This is about this town and it's about the American people and what they deserve, what they demand, what they expect and what they have a right to, which is the right to live free of undue interference from their national government. This, this vote is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. This is simply the end of the beginning. Washington may appear to have the upper hand at this moment, but it's essential that we remember that the American people will always have the final word. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President. Senator from Texas. Mr. President, three and a half years ago, perhaps reasonable minds could have differed over whether Obamacare would work. Perhaps reasonable minds could have differed over whether it would cripple the economy. Perhaps reasonable minds could have differed over whether it would be devastating to millions of Americans. Mr. President, today that's no longer the case. Today, we've seen the impacts of Obamacare. We've seen what it's doing. And Obamacare is a train wreck. It is a nightmare to use 
the words used by its lead Democratic author in the Senate and a union leader who previously supported Obamacare. Obamacare is the single largest job killer in this country. Obama, Obamacare is forcing Americans all over our nation into part-time work to working 29 hours a week or less. Obamacare is causing health insurance premiums to skyrocket all over this country. And Obamacare is jeopardizing the health care for millions of Americans, threatening that they will lose their health insurance altogether. It quite simply isn't working. And Mr. President, perhaps saddest of all, the United States Senate isn't listening. The Senate Democrats are not listening to the millions of Americans who are being hurt by Obamacare. If you're a young person right now coming out of school and finding door after door closed to you because small businesses aren't growing, because jobs aren't there, because we have the lowest labor force participation in decades, Senate Democrats aren't listening to you. If you're a single mom right now, perhaps waiting tables at a diner, and you're seeing your hours forcibly reduced to 29 hours a week, 29 hours a week are not enough to feed your kids. But that's what Obamacare is doing to you. And Senate Democrats aren't listening to you. If you're a recent immigrant trying to raise a young family working hard and seeing your health insurance premiums skyrocket and you're wondering how on earth you're going to be able to pay these rising premiums while still meeting the needs and expenses of your young family, Senate Democrats aren't listening to you. If you're retired, if you're a person with disabilities, getting notice from your insurance carrier that the policy is going to be dropped because of Obamacare, or if you're concerned that you will be getting notice, as so many others across this country have been, Senate Democrats aren't listening to you. If you're married, and on your spouse's health insurance, and you've received a notice like 15,000 employees at UPS recently received a notice, telling them that their spousal coverage was being dropped, that their husbands and wives were losing their health insurance because of Obamacare, Senate Democrats aren't listening to you. If you're a union worker working hard to provide for your family to seek the American dream, and you're discovering that the health insurance that you like, that you've worked for, that you've paid for, is going to be taken away from you because of Obamacare. Senate Democrats aren't listening to you. Now perhaps, Mr. President, some might say, how could it be that, that this is happening. Surely Senate Democrats would listen to the American people if that sort of suffering were happening. Well, if you don't take my word for it, let me urge you to take the word of James Hoffa, president of the Teamsters. And I'd like to read a portion of a letter Mr. Hoffa wrote recently to Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid and House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi. Dear Leader Reid and Leader Pelosi, when you and the President sought our support for the Affordable Care Act, you pledged that if we liked the health plans we have now, we could keep them. Sadly, that promise is under threat. Right now, unless you and the Obama administration enact an equitable fix, Obamacare will shatter not only our hard-earned benefits, but destroy the foundation of the 40-hour work week that is the backbone of the American middle class. That's not me speaking, that's James Hoffa, the president of the Teamsters. Like millions of other Americans, our members are on the front line, our front line workers in the American economy. We have been strong supporters of the notion that all Americans should have access to quality, affordable health care. We have also been strong supporters of you. I would note this is addressed to Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid and House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi. 
In campaign after campaign, we have put boots on the ground, gone door to door to get out the vote, run phone banks and raise money to secure this vision, the vision of a Democratic majority in the Senate. So how is that Democratic majority in the Senate working out for union workers across this country? Well, the next sentence in this letter is, now this vision has come back to haunt us. Mr. President, I would note this is the exact same sentiment I expressed a moment ago. Senate Democrats aren't listening to you. The letter continues, time is running out, Congress wrote this law, we voted for you, we have a problem, you need to fix it. The unintended consequences of the ACA are severe. Perverse incentives are already creating nightmare scenarios. Note that word nightmare, which I started my remarks by quoting, that's not my word, that's the Teamsters describing Obamacare. Indeed, the letter concludes by saying, on behalf of millions of working men and women we represent and the families they support, we can no longer stand silent in the face of the elements of the Affordable Care Act that will destroy the very health and well-being of our members along with millions of other hard-working Americans. Mr. President, let me note, number one, Mr. Hoffa says millions of working men and women not hundreds, not thousands, millions. And what does Mr. Hoffa say is happening to those millions of working men and women? That their health care is being destroyed. And destroyed is the word he used. And what answer do we get today from the Democrats in the Senate? Nothing. President Obama has granted exemptions from this failed law to big business and to members of Congress. So the friends of the administration don't have to bear the burdens of the law's collapse. But hard-working Americans, those without lobbyists, without friends in the corridors of power, they're getting no exemptions from Senate Democrats. Mr. President, that's wrong. Now, in roughly an hour, if senators vote as they have announced publicly they intend to vote, this body will vote to put back, to restore the funding for Obamacare and to gut the House continuing resolution. But the good news is the process isn't over. It's going to go back to the House of Representatives, and I salute the House for having had the courage to stand up and fight and defund Obamacare, and I remain confident, hopeful, and optimistic the House will stand their ground, will continue the fight, which means this issue is coming back to the Senate. And that is good news. That is good news, number one, for Republicans. It is unfortunate that there has been Republican division on this issue. And when it comes back to the Senate, after the House stands their ground yet again, we will have an opportunity for Republicans to come home, for Republicans to stand together. And I very much hope the next time this issue is before this body in a few days, that all 46 Republicans are united against Obamacare and standing with the American people, that we listen to the American people the way Senate Democrats are not. And let me tell you, I hope also that it's not just 46 Republicans. Our friends on the Democratic side of the aisle go home to their states, they listen to their constituents, they are hearing the suffering from the men and women who elected them. It is not easy to disagree with your political party, but at the end of the day, what we're doing here is bigger than partisan politics. What we're doing here is fighting for 300 million Americans across this great country. And so I hope when this issue comes back, when the House stands their ground and sends this back to us, that instead of just exercising brute political power, as this body is getting ready to do, I hope that Senate, Senate Democrats begin listening, that they begin listening to young people, that they begin listening to single moms, that they begin listening to immigrants, that they begin listening to people who are retired, people with disabilities, that they begin listening to married people, that they begin listening to union workers, all of whom are suffering under Obamacare. This is an opportunity for the Senate to return to the finest traditions of this body, where we listen to and fight for the American people. That hadn't happened in a long time, but I'm very hopeful that we are in the process of seeing it begin to happen now. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. I note the absence of quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
consent to further proceed on the quorum call be dispensed with? Without objection. <laughs> I'm not sure if you've got a fax machine at home. Not many Americans do anymore. Neither do a lot of small businesses. So it seems a bit odd to tell small businesses they need to fax in, that is, fax in enrollment forms for Obamacare. That's just what the Obama administration is now doing. Well, I might paraphrase the president. The 80s called, and they want their health policy back. Now, to be fair, <clears throat> Snail mail is also an option, and it looks like the President's people will try to have the issue fixed soon, despite passing the law more than three years ago. But then again, this is the same President who told us that Obamacare is working the way it's supposed to, President Obama said, and that those who already have health care won't see many changes under this law. The same guy who promised us his health care ideas would make American premiums lower, and that they'd be able to keep the plans they liked. So forgive me for being a little bit skeptical, given how these other rosy scenarios have played out. Now, I'm not the only skeptic out there. Just ask the folks who've already gotten laid off or seen their hours cut. Ask the graduate who can't find anything but part-time work. Ask the 20-something who's going to lose her employer health plan and pay more over in the exchanges. The reality simply does not match up with the rhetoric. And that includes the President's remarks yesterday over in Maryland. He said there's no widespread evidence that Obamacare is hurting jobs. That's actually what he said, no widespread evidence. Now, we all know the President was hanging around with Bill Clinton the other day. What we didn't know was that he was getting pointers on syntax. It makes you wonder, what would constitute widespread evidence of job loss in this president's mind? I mean, just yesterday, his press secretary dismissed reports of a company dropping health insurance for 55,000 employees as just, quote, an anecdote, end quote. Maybe that's how things look from the South Lawn. It looks a lot different if you just lost your health care plan that you liked and you wanted to keep. And as Senator Moynihan used to tell us, data is the plural of anecdote. Data is the plural of anecdote. There are just too many stories about the impact of Obamacare, far too many to be discussed with a wave of a hand. Ironically, the same day the President was painting more rosy scenarios in Maryland, the administration announced yet another delay in this law's implementation. That's about the time we found out about the fax machines and all that follows the revelation of yet more exchange problems, this time with an exchange here in the District of Columbia. You might be able to take any one of these many Obamacare problems in isolation and explain it away, say it doesn't matter, just call it an anecdote, but what we're getting here is a constant drip, drip, paired with the effects of seeing what is having, what's happening to our jobs and our health care and the economy. It all adds up to just one thing, a law in trouble, a law that needs to be repealed. That's the goal of every member of the Republican conference here in the Senate. We're united on the need to repeal Obamacare. We want to replace it with sensible bipartisan reforms that will actually work. And in a few minutes, each and every one of us will vote against funding Obamacare. The American people want this law repealed. Republicans want it repealed. I wouldn't be surprised if a number of our Democratic colleagues secretly want it repealed as well. The problem here is that we can't get that done unless some of our friends on the other side are prepared to step up and work with us on the issue because there are 54 of them and 46 of us. This doesn't mean we'll give up the fight if they don't. We won't. There are a lot of other things we can do in the meantime. For instance, we can follow the administration's lead in offering an Obamacare delay for the American people. After all, the administration seems to think businesses deserve a break from Obamacare. Doesn't the middle class deserve the same treatment, the very same treatment? Republicans think so. And I think we might be able to convince enough Democrats to join us on that, to help us provide fairness, fairness to the middle class. 
Yesterday, one Democratic senator already signaled his willingness to delay some of the worst aspects of the law as well. He called a delay for the American people very reasonable and sensible. He posed a question, don't you think that'd be fair? The answer is, yeah, that'd be fair. That's a question for my Democratic colleagues to respond to, many of whom know how badly this law is hurting their constituents. Isn't that just the fair thing to do? Of course it is. So I'm calling on Democratic senators to put the middle class ahead of the president's pride, calling for them to help us pass a delay for everyone. We've already filed legislation that would do just that. A bipartisan majority of the House already supports it. Let's work together to actually do it. Then once we get that done, let's keep working to get rid of this law and replace it with real reforms, not with ideas from the 1980s, but with common sense, step-by-step -step reforms that will actually lower the cost for the American people and spare them from this terrible law. Mr. President, I yield the floor. President. Under the previous order, the time until 12.30 is reserved for the two leaders with the final 10 minutes reserved for the majority leader. Mr. President. Majority leader. During my time in Washington, I've had the opportunity to work with many reasonable, thoughtful Republicans, including those serving in this body today. Those reasonable Republicans value this institution, the United States Senate, and they respect the government of which it's a part. But today, the Republican Party has been infected by a small but destructive faction that would rather tear down the house our founders built than govern from it. These extremists are more interested in putting on a show, as one Republican colleague put it, than in legislating. That's why they prevented the Senate from taking action to avert a government shutdown last night to put on a show today. Despite pleas from the House of Representatives for a quick Senate action, that same vocal minority was determined to waste the dwindling hours before a government shutdown. One day, basically, they wasted. Although every minute that passes puts this country one minute closer to a shutdown, a shutdown that would shatter our economy, yet they continue to obstruct and to delay. But you see, Mr. President, a bad day for government is a good day for the anarchists among us. Those who believe in no, I repeat, no government. That's their belief. The modern day anarchists, known as the Tea Party, they believe in no government. And they're backed by a very wealthy group of people who finance this effort to destroy our government. It's important to note that these Tea Party obstructions don't represent mainstream Republicans, either in this body or mainstream Republicans in our country. But unfortunately, their grip on the rudder of the Republican Party is very firm. For the last few years, these radicals in the House and the Senate have driven America from crisis to crisis. We lurch from crisis to crisis, leaving a trail of economic destruction behind. And now they've taken the United States government hostage and demanded an impossible ransom. The Democrats repeal the law of this land known as Obamacare. The Affordable Care Act has been the law of the land for four years. The United States Supreme Court has declared it constitutional. And soon it will help 25 to 35 million people in America who are currently living without health insurance. It will allow them to get access to life-saving care they need and deserve. Mr. President, I don't know if people really know what it means to not have health insurance, not have the ability to go to the doctor or hospital when you're sick or hurt. Some of us do, Mr. President. Some of us understand how tens of millions of people in America today can't go to the hospital when they're sick or when they're hurt. Mr. President, I was a boy. I don't know how old I was, 10 or 11 years old. I was so, so sick. I can still remember how sick I was. I've been sick for quite a long time. The little house we lived in. 
But you see, we didn't have doctors in searchlight. There wasn't a doctor for 50 miles. And we had no car. I was really sick. We didn't go to doctors. But it was obvious that I was really ill. And so, one of my older brothers came to visit. And they were with a friend. That friend of my brother, Don, uh, agreed to take him to the hospital. So I went to the hospital, and I still have the scar, Mr. President. And had a growth on my large intestine, ad intestine. I would have died had I not gone to the hospital. I know what it's like not to be able to go to the hospital or go to the doctor when you're sick. Mr. President, my wonderful mother, uh, who took in Wash, uh, searched like we had a, nothing much there, but once I remember a TB wagon came through, which was a truck, that they would do x-rays of somebody's chest to find out if they had tuberculosis, because it was still around. People in searchlight, I remember Con Hudgens had tuberculosis and others. So this, my dad wouldn't go. My mother went and had her chest x-ray. Mr. President, the results came back in a little card in the mail. She had tuberculosis. She was positive for tuberculosis. What did we do? What did she do? Nothing. Nothing. As a boy caring about my mother, I worried so much about that. I can't imagine even to this day how she must have felt. Well, in hindsight, Ms. President, it looks like it was a false positive. But that didn't take away the concern that I had for a long time. And I can't imagine, I repeat, how my mother must have felt. So I have had some view of what it's like not to be able to go to the doctor or hospital when you're sick or hurt. Mr. President, again, I don't know how old I was, but my little brother, 22 months younger than I am, is coming on his bicycle and he slides and he was hurt. And, uh, and he was crying. I guess he's 10 years old or something like that. And no one was home, and I helped him get up to the house and laid down. He was so, I went and found my mother. My brother never, ever went to the doctor, had a broken leg. He still has the bent leg to show it today. He laid on that bed. He couldn't touch the bed. It hurt so much. He laid there till he could get up and walk. A week or ten days later. So these people who just nonchalantly uh, don't focus on the fact that millions of Americans have no health insurance. We can't just walk away from this. The health care law that we have, Mr. President, is important. Republicans fought long and hard in opposition to Obamacare. Mr. President, they lost. It was a fair fight. And they made their case against Obama directly to the American people in November last. And they lost again. Obama won, not by a small margin, he won by five million votes. What was the main issue in that campaign? It was health care. The American people overwhelmingly re-elected the president. One reason they did is because of health care. Yesterday on this floor, from over there, a colleague of ours, a senior senator from Arizona, John McCain, spoke 
with great eloquence about this law. A law he opposes. This is what he said. The people spoke. They spoke, much to my dismay, but they spoke and re-elected the President of the United States. That doesn't mean that we give up our efforts to try to replace and repair Obamacare, but elections have consequences. The majority of the American people supported the President of the United States and renewed his stewardship of this country. I don't like it, he said, but I think all of us should respect the outcome of elections which reflect the will of the people. Close quote. Who, who said this again? Who said this? Who is this John McCain? He's a proven fighter in war and in public service. This is a man who held the mantle of the Republican Party's nomination to be President of the United States. Not some gadfly, but an American patriot. And history books will talk about that in generations to come. The Republicans heard his message for which the Senate and the country should be grateful. So, Mr. President, the challenge This fall, closing in on the end of the fiscal year, those of us who respect the system of government devised by America's founders, those of us who believe in the rule of law and the elections reflect the will of the people, will face a test. Can we prevent an economically disastrous government shutdown, and can we protect the full faith and credit of the United States? Mr. President, one newspaper, not lots of newspapers, one newspaper, Look at the headlines. <clears throat> GOP hardliners block strategy to avoid shutdown. <clears throat> Government shutdown would entail costs. Shutdown could carry pay risk even for employees kept on the job. One newspaper. Agencies prepare to furlough workers in face of partial government shutdown. Shutdown grows more likely as House digs in. Governor Christie, quote, shutdown would be a failure. It would be irresponsible. A government shutdown looms. America's brace for possible disruption, disappointment. Another headline, surrounding jurisdictions develop shutdown game plans. Threat of shutdown delays some Colorado flood relief. Is it any wonder the stock market is going down? Is it any wonder that people are concerned? Is it any wonder that someone like the woman who works for the Park Service that came to see me yesterday said to me, I've been through this before. I'm not going to get paid for my work. So the question is, can we overcome modern day anarchists? So in just a few minutes, Mr. President, the Senate will take the first step toward wresting control from these extremists. Democrats will vote to avert a government shutdown. I'm confident many of my Republican colleagues will vote with us to allow the government to perform its basic duties. Together, we'll send a message to radical Republicans that we will not allow the law of the land to be used as a hostage, a law that's been in place for four years. I'm pleased that so many of my Senate Republican colleagues seem to understand the stakes of this debate the economic health of a still struggling nation, and the economic well-being of still struggling families. I urge sensible Republicans in the House of Representatives to follow our lead, to follow the lead of Republicans over here. Let the House Democrats vote. Don't just make it a majority of the majority. Let the 435 members who serve in the House of Representatives, let them vote. Pass a clean bill to avert a shutdown. Defy the anarchists. Respect the rule of law and help the Senate govern. Mr. President, I ask uh, that the time that's left for Senator McConnell and me uh, be uh, given back and that we begin the vote. Without objection, all time is yielded back. The clerk will report the motion to invoke cloture.
cloture motion. We undersign senators in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate. Hereby move to bring to a close a debate on H.J. Res. 59, a joint resolution making continuing appropriations for fiscal year 2014 and for other purposes. Signed by 17 senators. By unanimous consent, the mandatory quorum call has been waived. The question is, is it the sense of the Senate that debate on H.J. Res. 59, making continuing appropriations for fiscal year 2014 and for other purposes, shall be brought to a close? The yeas and nays are mandatory under the rule. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayotte, Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Balkus, Mr. Beckage, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Chiesa, Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Corker, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Donnelly, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Flake. Mr. Franken, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Heitkamp, Mr. Heller, Ms. Rono, Mr. Hoven, Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Kane, Mr. King, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. L Ms. Landrew, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. McCain, Mrs. McCaskill, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Ms. Mikulski, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Paul, Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Risch, 
Mr. Roberts. Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Scott. Mr. Sessions. Mrs. Shaheen. Mr. Shelby. Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Udall of Colorado. Mr. Udall of New Mexico. Mr. Vitter. Mr. Warner. Ms. Warren. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden. Senators voting in the affirmative. Blunt, Cantwell, Cardin, Cornyn, Johans, Kane, Kirk, McConnell, Mikulski, Murphy, Reed of Nevada, Rockefeller, and Sanders. Mr. Bitter voted in the negative. Mr. Wicker. Aye. Mr. Durbin. Aye. Ms. Coates. Mr. Coates. Aye. Mr. Manchin. Aye. Mr. Franken. Mr. Franken. Aye. Mr. Paul. No. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island. Aye. Mr. Corker, aye. Mr. Lee, no. Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham, aye. Ms. Ayotte? Aye. Ms. Ayotte, aye. Mr. Cruz? Mr. Cruz, no. Mr. Schatz? Mr. Schatz, aye. Mr. Crapo? No. Mr. Isaacson. Mr. Isaacson. Aye. Mr. Tester. Aye. Mr. Pryor. Mr. Pryor. Aye. Mr. Chiesa. Aye. Mr. Enzi. Mr. Enzi, no. Mr. 
Mr. Merkley. Mr. Merkley, aye. Mr. Chambliss, aye. Mrs. Fisher, no. Mr. Whitehouse, aye. aye. Mr. Alexander. Mr. Alexander, aye. Mrs. Murray, aye. Mr. Wyden, aye. Ms. Klobuchar, aye. Mrs. Boxer, Mrs. Boxer, aye. Mr. McCain, Mr. McCain, aye. Mr. Coburn, Mr. Coburn, aye. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer. Aye. Mr. Warner. Aye. Mr. Roberts? Mr. Roberts, no. Ms. Heitkamp, aye. Mr. Cochran? Mr. Cochran, no. Mrs. Gillibrand, aye. Mr. Cochran, aye. Mr. Burr, aye. Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Feinstein, aye. Mrs. Hagen, aye. Mrs. Shaheen, aye. Mr. Scott, no. Mr. Heller, no. Mr. Leahy, aye. Mr. Grassley, no. Mr. Toomey, Mr. Toomey, no. Mr. Levin, aye. Mr. Markey, aye.
Ms. Collins. Ms. Collins, aye. Um, Mrs. McCaskill, aye. Mr. King, aye. Mr. Udall of New Mexico, aye. Mr. Moran, no. Mr. Donnelly, aye. Ms. Hirono, aye. Ms. Warren, aye.